Guys, I'm going to first start off by saying, listen, first of all, thanks a lot. This is the first uh, of a couple of uh, online seminars that I would like to run. Um, I get asked an, a number of questions, uh, either via email or I get asked questions via WhatsApp or SMS. And a lot of the, the, the answers to these questions could actually be answered in seminars like these, so that when eventually you go for a contact session with either a trainer like myself or another recognized trainer, which is what I'm going to discuss in this first session, a lot of those questions would have already been answered or you'll know exactly what to look out for when you're looking for specific training. So I'm going to start off with, uh, first of all, just showing you, I'm going to hold it up here. Uh, the, these are lesson plan notes. Um, this is a very important thing. And this specific one that I've got here, this is, this is referred to as mind mapping, okay? Um, and you're going to see why I have this. I refer to this as a menu. Um, it's extremely important. So first of all, straight out of the bat, an introduction. For those of you that are new to getting to know me, my first name is Dean. My surname is Nivote. Um, and I, I own a company called Fundi Kono, which is a traditional Zulu word for a place to find a skill or knowledge. I don't want to go into too much about my background. If you need to know that, ask me and I'll fax you or email you my CV. But what is important is that at the beginning of this training intervention, I uh, lay out a couple of things. Number one, what is our objectives for being here? Our objectives for being here is, first of all, to have fun and con connect with other like-minded people. I'm sure you'll all agree with me. Uh, but what is important in terms of our objectives for this specific training intervention is, is to assist you to have a better understanding um, of training and the type of trainer that you seek to engage with. We're all living in very difficult times at the moment where disposable income is, is not uh, as disposable as what it has been. We're going through COVID-19. Businesses are taking strain and it's not just here, it's abroad as well. I mean, we've got two, three people here that are actually online from overseas. And I can tell you now that this is not only hitting us in South Africa, it's all over. It's not just a South African thing. So our objectives are clearly stated right at the onset for this training intervention. Secondly, our outcomes. What are our outcomes? The outcomes must be measurable. You must have spent some time with me. Um, if you've been on any lectures with me or any uh, contact sessions, you'll know that I always have specific outcomes. Well, this evening's outcomes is as follows. At least when you have completed this session with me, you will have a better understanding um, of how, of whom you should actually go and, and, and spend your hard earned cash with in terms of a trainer. Um, you need to look out for some certain, well, there's certain things you should be looking out for uh, as to where you're going to be spending your money and what type of training you're actually going to be seeking. So that, that is important. And these measurable outcomes is, is that the training that you're going to be looking for should be relevant to your needs. Um, it should be current and it should be cost effective. Those are the three pillars that we want to look out for. So those are the three measurable outcomes that you need to have. And that's what you need to make a note of. I asked you guys just to have a pen and paper handy. Those are the three outcomes that you need to write down right from the get-go. The length of tonight's session should be around about 40 minutes all in all. Uh, I'll try and stick to that. I will have questions and answers at the end, which brings me to the next point. If you have questions, please just jot them down and either ask me at the end of the session or email me or contact me and I will answer those questions for you. But you'll see that if you jot them down throughout the actual lecture or the presentation or our interactive discussion that we're going to have, they will more than likely be answered by yourselves or someone else within the panel or myself. So that's basically what we, uh, we're looking at. Let's just set some ground rules. If you need to take a phone call, guys, take a phone call. If you've got and found your mute button as Mohammed has, has gone and done, please just mute so we don't listen to your phone call because uh, that might be embarrassing when you get back to us. Uh, comfort breaks, if you need to get up and go take a comfort break, don't, don't tell us. We, we don't need to know that. Um, and then, of course, just please find out where your mute button is and if at all possible, put on your camera so that we, I can see who I'm talking to because sometimes the names come up and I've got acronyms up on the screen here so I can see who it is that I'm actually discussing and I'm, I'm talking to. It's difficult for me because I'm looking into a camera, a little pinhole camera here, and I'm not actually looking directly at you. How's it, David? See you there, bud. Hi, Dean. Okay. Then, of course, as I say, questions and answers at the end. I'll try and answer as many questions as I can. And then, of course, in closing, uh, at the end of it, I will obviously give you a synopsis of what we've discussed. Any questions thus far, guys? We're all good. We're all good, guys? 
Yes, yeah, we are. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Right. So, how do we choose a trainer? What qualities does a trainer have to have? These are very important questions because it comes back to cash earned. How, how are you going to spend your money and who are you going to go seek training with? Well, first of all, you'll notice that I'm using a term trainer and I'm not using the word instructor. There's a massive difference. I'm also not using the word coach or facilitator or mentor or teacher. I'm using the word trainer. I just want to run through a couple of things in terms of definitions, just to put you in the picture. And these can be written down by yourself if you want to write them down or jot them down. And I'll move relatively quickly. So just write in your best shorthand possible that you can read. No one else has to read it. Um, as in my mind mapping, and most people are, not, are unable to read my mind maps. The first thing that I'd like to just discuss with you is the definition of a trainer, or what a, or sorry, a teacher, what a teacher does. A teacher is somebody who imparts theoretical skill and knowledge. And that is different to an instructor. An instructor is a person who imparts practical skills or knowledge. So if I was to hold up my, my instructor's card that says that, I'm a, I don't know if you guys can see it there, it says that I'm an instructor and I'm permitted to instruct on handgun, shotgun, submachine gun, rifle, assault rifle. And if you look at the back, it says that I'm an advanced instructor. Sure. I'm an advanced instructor. That's quite an important thing, an important title there. Eh? I must tell you that an instructor is not a teacher and a teacher is not an instructor. I actually, we have, an, we have a teacher amongst us here. It's actually sitting here. Where is he? Zaid, you there? Yeah, there's Zaid. He's a teacher. So a teacher imparts theoretical knowledge and instructor imparts or instructs practical skills or knowledge. Anybody tell me what a facilitator is? Anybody want to have a bash? Don't have to put up your hand or click put up your hand. Just shout it out. We don't mind. Anyone want to have a go? Facilitator. I'll give you the definition of a facilitator because I also happen to be a facilitator. A facilitator is somebody who assists another person to reach their objectives and or outcomes. In other words, that person is somebody who opens the door to education, makes the education process possible for that person to acquire a new skill or knowledge. Skill or knowledge, skill or knowledge, skill, practical skills or knowledge, theoretical knowledge. And then, of course, we have another person in the mix here called a coach. Anybody knows what the definition of a coach is? Hi there, Mohammed Suleiman. How are you? I'm going to give you the quick definition of a coach. A coach is somebody who has an experience in a specific field that guards and assists somebody to meet their personal goals and objectives. So what I'd like to say is these four slash five, if you include somebody who's referred to as a mentor, all have different types of skills in imparting knowledge or skill, but they are not one and the same person. And it's very important that you understand this, that when you go and seek training, specifically in the fields that you people are looking for, and this could be applied to sport. It could be applied to uh, martial arts or hand-to-hand -hand combat. Because remember, martial arts is exactly that. It's an art. It's not fighting. So if you are looking for somebody to go and spend money with to impart skills or knowledge, you need to understand what kind of person you are going to be meeting with to teach you these skills or knowledge. Does that make sense, guys? Yeah. Right. So a trainer, most importantly, a trainer needs to have each and every one of those skills, being a teacher, a facilitator, an instructor, a coach. And if the person happens to be a repeat client, like I have here at Fundy Corner, I have a number of repeat clients that have been training with me over the years, a mentor. So to be a trainer, you need to be each and every one of those people and know the skills that those people have. Have I been able to clarify something? So what, what skills should a trainer have? 
Well, a trainer should have a teaching qualification, some form of teaching qualification, preferably specializing in adult education. Because adults learn a lot differently to kids that go to school. Adults do not like to be instructed to do anything. It's difficult enough getting, for example, this evening, 32 people to meet at a specific time in a specific place for a facilitation or a training session like we're having at the moment. So if we go back to the skills that a trainer should have is they should have some form of teaching qualification. And I need to clarify something here. Having an assessor's qualification, like a lot of our firearms instructors in the industry at the moment, does not make you a teacher, does not make you a trainer. It makes you an assessor. The next thing that we need to have as a trainer is you need to be presentable. Well-groomed as I am. You can see I did my hair before coming on camera. I had to put it in a side pass this evening. Shelly will be impressed. <laughs> you should be presentable. You should be punctual. And most importantly, you should be approachable. Now, I know there's a couple of you laughing there. I can see the grins on your faces. You're looking at me and you're going approachable. Yeah. I am slightly abrasive, but I am approachable. The reason why I'm abrasive is because I'm exposed to the reality of life in South Africa. What is important from a trainer is, is that you have good or an excellent grounding in the subject matter that you are going to be training somebody in. Now, let me explain to you something about this. This is something very important. For a trainer to lecture, or to provide you skills in a specific area. And I'm going to choose one that I like the most because I spent a lot of time grappling with it. The use of force against another human being, whereby the outcome, the third fight, those that have trained with me know exactly what I'm talking about when I talk about the third fight, is you now end up in a court of law and you have to explain those actions that you've taken and the level of force to which you've used against another human being. If you've never had to go and give evidence in a court of law as a trainer for people that you have trained, unfortunately, you do not have that experience. It is just that simple. So this is something that's very important that you need to look at in the trainer that you are investing your hard-earned cash in. The, the importance of having those skills which are referred to in training as essential embedded knowledge is of paramount importance. So, another skill that needs to be added to that is understanding the knowledge and skill that you are imparting with other people and knowing when to play the role of a teacher, when to play the role of an instructor, when to fit and play the role as a facilitator or a coach. And the reason being is, is that when I have, for example, in my school, and uh, some of you have been on course where I've had numbers, numbers totaling 27 on a course or 32 people on a course, almost 33 a platoon size of people on a course, I need to look at each and individual person on that course and provide them with the best possible training for that individual coming on the course, not just the group. So I need to be able to move between those skills as a good trainer and see that I'm actually reaching those people and they are getting exactly what they need from me as a trainer. And I hope that makes sense to you guys. What's important as a trainer as well, and especially, um, as a facilitator is, is that I assist my students to reach measurable outcomes. Now measurable outcomes can be looked at in two different spheres here. You can look at a individual's personal objectives and outcomes, and you can look at outcomes which are measurable in terms of a unit standard or a qualification. And the means that I use and the techniques that I use as a trainer to get you there to these measurable outcomes is extremely important. If I don't get you to those measurable outcomes as a trainer, I have failed as a trainer. 
and I have not been able to honestly do the job that you've employed me to do. So I'm just going to use a different facet of training just for a couple of minutes here. Amongst us here, there's a couple of us that participate in dog training. When you go and seek training from a trainer who provides training in the use of a dog for protection, you need to understand that that trainer needs to be able to take you to a level whereby you are going to be able to reach either your goals and outcomes or objectives or the objectives based upon what's written down in text as in a qualification. Very, very important. I would say the most important ability of a trainer is to be able to integrate the theoretical component of a skill, correction knowledge, into a practical skill. So where I'm going with this is I'm going to go back to the use of force. Those of you that have trained with me when it comes to the use of lethal force will know that when I teach you to draw a firearm, I will never instruct you to put your finger on the trigger until you have made a conscious decision to fire the gun, correct? Being able to integrate the use of force based upon the force continuum and legislation with the practical skill is of vital importance. And there's a story that I'd like to share with you. Many years ago when I was in the SAPS, I was a SWAT instructor. And we used to teach a technique that was taught by the Israelis to draw, cock, and fire your weapon. Two rounds, two shots, known as a double tap. And um, the average police officer would spend day after day practicing with an empty firearm, accessing the gun out of the holster. We used to carry uh, leather holsters back in those days. We hadn't heard of this, this stuff called Cardex. And um, this leather holster... You would have to break the thumb brake, draw the pistol. You would have to cycle or cock the gun at a very high position, preparing the gun to fire, being old and all, uh, all the top weapons that have a hammer or those of you that carry old guns like CZs out there, not these modern guns like Glocks, you know, the best gun in the world. Um, just joking. I'm getting lots of head shakes left and right there. I'm sorry about that, guys. Sorry, CZ owners. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry you bought a CZ. Should I ask for your money back? Um, oh, they won't give you the money back. Oh, that's terrible. Um, sure. I've just lost three people. They've all clicked cheers goodbye. Sorry about that. Um, preparing the gun to fire, they would then point the gun at an, at an object or target, which was a humanoid shaped type target and pull the trigger twice. And this is repeated over and over and over again during training. There was a young police officer that was trained and he got involved in a situation where he was required to prepare the firearm for a possible use of force situation. He drew the pistol out of his holster. He prepared the firearm to finally automatically pull the trigger twice and shot somebody that did not need to be shot. Do you see a problem with this? The problem is, is that we continually prepare somebody for a com combative type role by teaching them a technique and teaching it and hardwiring it into the system. Some of you might have heard the term muscle memory. Well, those that have been training with me know that not muscle memory does not exist. There is no such thing. Muscles don't have memory. But anyway, it was hardwired into his system and he drew the pistol, he prepared it and pulled the trigger when he didn't need to pull the trigger. So what happened there is, is that uh, he ended up in court and shortly after ending up in court, he was defended by a very good uh, legal practitioner that happens to be a friend of mine. And uh, through the training and through the expertise of this legal practitioner, giving evidence in court, he led evidence in such a manner is, is that he asked this young police officer how many years service he had. He said he had seven years service. How much training had you received? What courses had you been on? And he pulled out a whole quiver of courses that he had been on, one of them being a SWAT course. 
you asked them on SWAT training, how are you taught to prepare your firearm for combat? And you actually asked him to come to the front of the courts and do a demonstration. This policeman took his firearm out, drew it, cocked it, and pointed it across the courtroom and said that's when he was obviously going to pull the trigger. So what this legal practitioner did in the court of law is he turned around and said, well, it's not the police officer's fault. It's a training fault. And the training fault is as such that he was taught to draw, cock, and pull the trigger on this firearm. So the question that he asked this young police officer in front of the court was this, Constable so-and-so, how many times have you been taught to draw, cock, and not fire the weapon? where you have to make a conscious decision to fire the weapon as opposed to just pulling the trigger automatically. Not once, sir, he repeated to the court. Well, we all know where that case ended up. But there it just goes to show that incorrect training and incorrect repetitive training can be a problem. And that's why the choice of trainer is so important and it's of vital importance. It brings me to a point that I need to discuss with you about the currency of training. If you're employing the services of a very good trainer, then what you need to look at is, is you need to look at the following. The material that the trainer is presenting, is it current? Now, how would you know that? You need to go and research that. You need to have a look at what the trends are. So, where would this appear? Well, a good trainer will arrive on time, suitably dressed, presentable, with these lecture notes prior to the lecture. I had been on many occasions asked if I would do a collaboration course with trainers from other provinces, only to arrive at the facility where I'm going to do the presentation and this trainer to be scrib scribbling his, his uh, lesson plans down on a piece of paper no bigger than a half, a, a half a, an A4 size piece of paper. That is not your lesson plans. Your lesson plans need to be well structured. They need to be presentable. You need to have structured outcomes and you need to have clear objectives in the beginning so you know where you're going. The structured approach to your lesson plans are extremely important. Now, I want to just get back to those objectives that I mentioned earlier. You've got two types of objectives that need to be met when a trainer presents training material. One, measurable outcomes in terms of a qualification or standard that a person needs to attain. Or two, a personal, the student, the learner that's coming on the course, their personal objectives and outcomes. So the trainer needs to get to know you. And the trainer needs to know what your outcomes are. Now, whenever I have courses or I present courses, whether they be empty hand, whether they be impact weapon, edge weapon, whether they be um, firearm related, you will notice that I walk around and I will try and find out as much about your needs as possible. Because ultimately, not all of you have exactly the same needs in terms of your training criteria or the requests that you have in terms of your training. So these are the points that you need to be on the lookout for when you are looking for a trainer. I hope that this has been informative and I hope that you can take away from this some information that if you are seeking training, whether it be going to the local gym to look for a fitness trainer, that you are able to put this into practice. Guys, if there are any questions thus far, please just shoot ahead. Just let me know if you have any questions and I will answer them in front of the, the rest of the group. Fire away. I've got that one. Thanks, Cronia. Is there anything that you would like me to clarify? Because I know that I've gone through it relatively quickly, but I want to make sure that everybody gets a clear understanding of what I was trying to get at in this specific training intervention on the first one out the gate. The ability to choose a trainer, extremely important. 
So I've got a question. You said the ability to choose a trainer, but at the same time, you've brought up the example of a trainer that you co-hosted with that was scribbling his notes prior to the meeting. Is there some sort of forum or a platform where people will like Yelp or something where people will actually rate trainers? Because you won't know that sort of thing until you rock up there. Functionality, dressness, uh, being on time and all that sort of stuff. You'll only find out once you've spent your money, you paid a deposit and you're on site. Is there a platform for firearms or combat training or anything where people can actually take a look at reviews on trainers and make reviews if needs be? Not very good question. Yes, there is. There are two avenues here that you can look at when you are looking for training. Number one, um, in my next, just quickly before I answer your question, in my next training intervention, which will be next week, Tuesday, I'm going to talk very briefly. It will be a half an hour's discussion about what courses you should be looking out for. However, bridging from this uh, training intervention to the next training intervention. I can mention this to you. There are two types of trainers or training that you get in South Africa. You get unit standard based training, which leads to a formal qualification, which I will discuss on Tuesday. And you get non unit standard based training, which is presented by trainers uh, that are not presenting unit standard based training as such. However, they are still good quality trainers. If you look at the unit standard based training, you can go onto any of the sites that control or uh, ensure that training is done correctly. Um, one of them is via the SAS CETA, which is the Security, Safety and Security Sector Education Training Authority. And you can check out which trainers are in your area and they will have a list of reputable trainers. Um, I'm using the term trainers there. I would rather use the term instructors for those. In terms of trainers in South Africa, there are a couple of sites such as Gunsight. You can go on and ask a question. And there is the forum there whereby uh, people that train or have attended training in South Africa will give you feedback about a specific trainer in the area in which you stay and or trainers that operate within South Africa. Or not, I hope I was able to answer your question, but Yes, thank you very much. And on that on that same note, those reputable sort of Yelp type reviews will also help you guys as trainers. And I've attended one of your courses and I've actually thoroughly enjoyed it. I walked away with a lot. It, it actually for your guys will also help if we go on one of your courses and we are satisfactory to go on there and actually, you know, give a shout out so that the other person that comes next will actually be able to have more of a base of decision-making to, to, to draw from, from other people's experiences. Okay, well, thank you very much. That was my question sorted. Absolutely. Thank you very much for that. Just something else, Conrad, is that um, with most of your reputable trainers, they will have some form of platform of advertisement, such as I have Facebook. I like to use Facebook because it's, it's, it's easy. I can reach uh, everybody that I train with uh, quite easily. I always ask for feedback, positive and negative, um, in terms of constructive criticism, in terms of the training that I presented. Other reputable trainers, if you're researching, should have the same type of platform and should not hide anything from possible course attendees or people who have attended and could possibly be a repeat client. Ridwan, how are you? How's it, Dean? Rids, how are you? Good and you? Very good. How's Kimberly? Nice and cold. Nice and cold. I'm glad I could make it. Duty off was late tonight, but I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Guys, just to let you know, Ridwan has joined us. He's a fellow trainer. He's one of the other trainers in the country that I do talk of very highly. He's a highly experienced trainer. And I would recommend that you attend any of his training, whether it be unit standard based or non unit standard based training. Any other questions that you'd like to ask or would you like me to carry on with some, I can elaborate on some of the areas that I discussed, which I do feel quite important. Clint, you're upside down there, but you fell over. Yeah, my battery is dying, so I had to plug it in. So I'm 
juggling this thing now. Guys, one of the things that we uh, often see in a trainer or in an instructor, a coach or facilitator is that you get two types of trainers out there. You get a trainer that designs his own material or her own material, and it would either be unit standard based or non-unit standard based material that has been designed, and they are able to present that from the, the lecture notes, the training notes that they have constructed. It should have all the, the, the information that I discussed earlier, such as a good introduction. It should have a clear objectives, clear outcomes, more or less how long the lesson is going to be, the contents of the lesson. They might not give you all the contents of what they're going to teach because there's a lot of plagiarism in our industry. I'm sure Ridwan will agree with me. There's a lot of plagiarism that takes place. Um, that is, those kind of people are referred to uh, in the industry as non-unit standard based trainers because they don't follow the copy and paste norms of instructors. There are a number of people who provide training in South Africa who are copy and paste trainers. So in other words, they don't have the ability to go and design their own material. What they will do is, is they will go into and buy into a system where they obtain training material and then they go and present the material which they've gone and obtained. Those we refer to as copy and paste trainers. I, don't, I wouldn't spend money with people like that personally, but that's just my own opinion. Dean, yes. just a quick question. I know in the past you had, um, it's called a training or something down there in Durban where you had a, again, excuse me for not uh, knowing the name, a lawyer that came to speak to you with regards to the uh, use of firearms for self-defense in these uh, type subjects. What's the chance of you actually getting him on one of these uh, type webinars? Um, the person you're referring to is Mr. Jacques Witter. Um, he is one of the top uh, criminal lawyers in the country. Um, Jacques has agreed to come and attend some of the training that I present. Um, he has and does present for me once, twice a year, presents a legal lecture. I am and I, I have been in discussions with him with regards to doing a webinar and we are looking at setting one up. Gronier, the problem is, is that you can ask some of the guys on the group here that have been on course with Jacques, is, is that he will tell you that he's only going to lecture for an hour. Neil's laughing. Okay. Um, he's only going to lecture for an hour. I can see uh, Greg's laughing as well. And three hours later, um, he's still busy presenting. He is an extremely knowledgeable person. And having come from a law enforcement background, we had both served in the SAPS having come from being a senior specialist public prosecutor dealing with firearm and knife-related crime, he is a wealth of knowledge and experience. I will try to get him for a webinar. Um, just keep in mind, though, that I hope you've got a lot of data because that hour lecture is not going to be an hour. It's going to be Endless. a lot longer. Brian's laughing. I can see he's chuckling away there. Uh, the last one, Brian, was it an hour? <laughs> it was about four hours, I think. <laughs> oh, there you go, four hours. Okay, so guys, yes, I am thinking of getting, well, Jock and I have discussed it. I was at Jock's place a couple of days ago and we had discussed possibly doing a webinar, but what we're looking at possibly doing is just trimming it down to where he provides just the, for Jock, it's going to be hard, but the key components of the use of force. Yeah. That'll be great. I think you'll have a much bigger audience because I'm sure that many people who'd like to attend it can't. Um, I think this webinar has actually opened it uh, for a lot of people. No, thanks, Cronia. Um, I, just, I just hope that by me clarifying a lot to do with a trainer or the aspects of a trainer has clarified some things for you. And I can't emphasize enough that a trainer needs to be an instructor. There are times that a trainer needs to be an instructor. For example, standing on a shooting range, teaching the use of lethal force, there needs to be an instructional element. But there also needs to be a teaching element and you need to be a teacher as well to be able to impart the theoretical skills. The facilitation part of it is just being able to measure each individual on the courses, their personal outcomes, and if there are measurable outcomes because they might be aiming towards a qualification and being able to get them there, using the different techniques to get them there. And then, of course, the coaching aspect. The coaching aspect is, is that's, that comes with experience. And what I mean by coaching aspect is a good coach 
has participated in that type of uh, 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 skill or knowledge that, they, that they're busy teaching or assisting to teach. And with the experience, able to guide somebody to that point. And that's what's important. Renee, how are you? Renine. Dean, can I ask you, what are the major uh, courses or areas of courses that you, you present as a matter of interest? The types of courses that I uh, present start off, um, well, I won't uh, go into it in too great a depth because uh, it's quite a lot to discuss, but just briefly, um, my fourth webinar I have planned is going to be on the use of force which was just touched on now by Cronia, who's overseas at the moment. But the courses that I present are based upon the force continuum. Uh, the first one that I present is the use of empty hands. I present impact edge weapon. I present uh, the use of oleoresin capsicum or your pepper sprays and your ECWs, and then of course your firearms. So everything on the force continuum is what I present, and that's my area of uh, working. Not expertise, I prefer not to be called an expert. Thanks. Was I able to help, David? Yeah, very much so. Okay, you must give me a shout out if you want any clarity on anything, David, and I'll, I'll get in contact with you. Um, thanks for making contact with me here tonight. Okay, we'll do, thank you. Ritz, is there something that you want to say? I see you talking there, but you yeah. Must... yeah. Dean, if, if I may comment and also ask you to elaborate on something. Um, I know I joined late, so I'm not sure if you covered it already. Um, but coming back to what you look for in a good trainer, I would say there are a few things that you could use to gauge. And that would be, first of all, how much does the trainer invest in his own training? Does he have the necessary training aids? Does the material look decent? Um, yeah. Um, another thing, I won't talk too much about that. Uh, you could perhaps elaborate. And one more thing, in terms of notional hours, does the notional hours compared to what I'm paying for a course actually make sense? Because there's, there's often um, an, an imbalance between the two. And that would be a good factor for me to use as, is this guy just selling me a karate in a can? Um, or does he actually know what he's talking about? And am I getting value for money? Thank you. Thanks, Ridge. You've, you've opened a can of whip ass, yeah? Okay, I'm gonna shoot and go ahead. First of all, let me explain to the, the, the guys out here what a notional hour is. I'm not sure if the guys know what a notional hour is. A notional hour is a term used by trainers um, correction facilitators on how long it takes an average person to acquire a skill or how much of a skill in one hour. So we have to work on averages, yeah? So one notional hour is equivalent to one hour of training, whether it be theoretical or practical. In terms of investment, a trainer should invest in their personal growth and skill. Now, I find that a lot of trainers um, if you go onto YouTube, there's a number of clips where a trainer will stand and he or she would like to demonstrate how fast or how quick they are able to draw and fire a gun at a target. I'd be a bit careful of that. Um, the, the objective is, is not me as a trainer to show you how fast I can do it. The objective is, is for me to get you to do it as fast as you can do it. So as a trainer, I should be going slower than the student so that you can see and use the techniques that I used to be able to get you to a point where you better, not me better. I don't have to shoot better than you. I got to shoot better than myself. So it shouldn't be about me and how fast I can shoot or how fast I can whip out my knife and slice and dice somebody. It's not about that. Well, how fast I can take out a baton and beat somebody. It's about 
me using techniques as a trainer. And one of the methods or techniques that I use as a trainer and one that RIDS would use is called an EDRP method of facilitation or teaching, where I explain something, I then demonstrate it at a realistic speed and pace, and then you imitate that to the point where you're able to do it on your own, and I send you on your way to go and practice it. It's called the EDRP method of facilitation or teaching. It's extremely important that a trainer uses techniques and methods to be able to transfer that skill across. Now, there's a lot of trainers out there that perform or teachers or instructors or whatever they like to call themselves or coaches out there um, that come from a shooting background. So they might have represented South Africa or they've shot and they've represented KwaZulu-Natal or a province or a specific area of, of South Africa. And because they're pretty good at a specific sport, they then want to teach people firearms. The problem that you have there is, is that they are only able to teach you the area of expertise that they are in, and that is sport shooting. Sport shooting is not realistic shooting. It is far from the truth. What you've got to understand about sport shooting is, is that you are in a very controlled environment whereby the minute that pro timer or the whistle, that pro timer is that sharp little tone that you hear coming out of a little box that's strapped to the side of the range officer. And the minute you hear that, you're given the green light to use lethal force on every target in front of you, of which you know where they are, and you know the distances to them, and you already know where you're going to be performing the reload. So that is a very unrealistic method of, or, 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 or approach to training. I'm not saying it's bad. It is a good means to get practice, but it is not realistic in any way. Getting back to what Ritz said about the investment of the trainer themselves, it is extremely important for the trainer to be able to attend as many courses as possible, both locally and internationally, and interact with other trainers, even attending other courses as a student, so that you yourself can become better. And that's why I do not like to be called an expert because I'm not. I'm an advanced learner, and that is it. Rids, I was hopeful. I hope I hope I was able to answer some of those questions. I'll leave anything out there. Thanks, Dean. No, no, that's excellent. Thank you. Any questions there? Tara, and I'll see you there. Derek, are there any questions? Nothing from me. Thank you, Dean. I appreciate that. Derek, I hope you've been able to pick up some bits and pieces. I know you're far away, um, and I hope this has no, been able to help you guys up there. Most definitely. I look forward to a few more on Zoom. 100%. Zaid? Yes, Dean, I'm here. Okay, Very informative. Thank you. You're a teacher, sir. Te teach me something. <laughs> Well, apart from the fact that, you know what, we all are stuck in the same position here. I think uh, we all just got to wait it out and be prepared, you know. Unfortunately, we all live in a time whereby everyone is trying to do the other person down in whatever form or fashion it may be, be it crime-related or non-crime-related. And with us being here in Westfield and with the crime situation, you know, you've always got to just make sure you've got your training done, you're prepared. And as you say, you know what, you never hope to use it, but should you need to use it, you must be able to do it. Absolutely. Thanks, I Appreciate it. Um, just to, uh, I don't want to give too much away, but uh, my brother from another mother, Ridwan, is going to be moving back to Durban soon. And uh, we will be presenting a lot of courses together, Rids. And uh, so there's going to be some exciting times. And I think this is going to be a, as soon as uh, next month, Rids, we should be up and running, ready to start running some stuff. Yeah, that's right. Both unit standard based training and non unit standard based training will be run by us. Yep. Clint, you're very quiet. Think, you're, you're a trainer as well. You're not added anything. I, yeah. I, yeah. Yeah, I think um, a lot of people that are listening in or that will be tuning into your, your future um, interventions would be new people. So if you could advise a newbie on the very basics, let's say four things, 
um, that they need to acquire. Because what I find is a trend, you know, because we sell gear as well as do training. I find that people that are new into this want to buy everything at once. You know, it's because now I've spent my entire life um, in a different industry. So I'm not talking about myself. I'm talking about your average guy. So I've never been in law enforcement or the military, the police. Never really given much thought to this entire industry and equipment and training related. So now that I've come on board, I own a firearm. You know, it sparks something in that individual. And information overload is what takes place at first. They're sitting on YouTube. They're reading articles and blogs the whole time. It's pretty difficult for them to choose what are, what are the few things that I need to prioritize right now. So they either go out and buy a whole lot of stuff. And, you know, we've all been down this road. Lucky enough, we've, we've, we've learned the hard way and we've got that experience now. We buy so much of stuff plenty of which you don't really need in the long run. And also in, in the effort to get everything at once, you tend to buy stuff that's of substandard quality or that isn't really practical or doesn't work. And I'm, I'm just asking you if you could mention four things and attributes of those four things, what to look for as a newbie. And then maybe in your courses, you'd be able to expand upon those things. Thanks, Rids. Okay, I will answer that uh, shortly, Rids. If uh, I just want to just say something here, um, I have had a couple of questions come up on the screen in front of me here, and a lot of them are actually very close to what you've just discussed, Rids. If I was to tell anybody what four things that you would need to go out and seek or add to your current situation, it's difficult for me to say sitting here not knowing a particular person's background or where they are at that stage. For example, if you do not currently own a firearm, then I would suggest to you very strongly that you make contact with Ridwan to start the process in terms of getting good quality unit standard based training, number one so that you can apply for your certificate of competency, correction, proficiency, get a certificate of proficiency. Secondly, get assistance with regards to the application for uh, your certificate of competency, which would lead to a good quality structured application, motivation for application for a firearm license, and then obviously the firearm license. That's for somebody who does not own a firearm. For somebody who owns a firearm currently right now in amongst us here and doesn't quite know where to start, your first starting point is, do you have a licensed firearm? Yes or no? Stop. Don't go any further. Seek advice on what equipment to purchase. Don't just go and buy equipment because you're going to end up with, like Ridwan and I, you're going to end up with a, a trommel in the garage full of holsters and belts and magazine carriers and torches and axes and flick knives and I don't know what else that just lies in a trommel and is not being used. Rather seek advice from someone knowledgeable. There are a couple of guys around that I can refer you to and you're more than welcome to inbox me privately and I'll steer you in that direction. But what you need is, is you need a good quality firearm, you need a good quality handheld flashlight, you need a good quality holster, a good quality belt and a good quality magazine carrier not negotiable that is not negotiable if you've gone and spent twelve thousand rand on the best gun in the world a glock sorry if you own a cz um you're on your own i'm just joking cz the good quality guns mohammed i see that finger um, <laughs> um then then stop don't buy anything until you've sought the right advice but I don't want to get too much into the equipment side of things because there is going to be uh, Tuesday next week, I'm going to run what courses you should be looking at. Just a quick little 40 minutes like I've done now. Now I've gone over time. Um, and the third webinar that I'm going to have is solely about equipment and what equipment you should be looking at getting. So you don't go out and buy and buy and buy. You buy once. Okay. There's an Afrikaans saying, good quip is deed quip. Ian, if I may, yes. 
Um, about a year or so ago, I, I attended one of your night shooting classes and I rocked up there with a little talk craft torch and you looked at me and you just smiled. And at the end of the night, I walked away with one of your little jet beam things and that torch has been traveling with me for since that course, which is about a year ago. So building on that, sometimes the best way to figure out what equipment works for you is to actually have stuff fail on you. Like that little talk craft torch died in the first half an hour and I made a deal with you for this torch on the spot. So sometimes the, the best lessons learned are the hard knocks that you take down the line. So coming to holsters and stuff, I've gone through thousands of holsters until I found something that worked for me and that has been on me for 10 years now. So as much as advice helps you, everybody's uh, got opinion and we all know what that's like. Um, but uh, on a course like yours, something as stupid as a little torch. Okay, well, it was it is a decent torch. It's come with me a long way. As you sort of bring itself out to work for you, whereas uh, advice is built on personal experience, like holsters, some like sticky holsters, some like shoulder holsters, some like all sorts of holsters. And I eventually found one that worked for me. Um, which is not definitely going to work for you, um, but you know, just building on on your on your on what you just said, the perfect example is this little torch, which now travels with me wherever I go, and it has really paid for itself ten times over. Anyway, that's just my ten cents. Well, thanks, Gunnar. And uh, yes, I remember the low light course you're attending with the uh, I call them never readies. Um, they generally don't work, or they do, but not for very long. Um, guys, yeah, I don't want to talk too much about equipment uh, because uh, I'm going to do an entire webinar on equipment and I'll have some stuff here and um, you know that I work very closely. It's no secret that I work very closely with Ridwan and he is a man that sells really good, good equipment, really good gear. So I will, I will touch on that. Um, are there any other questions with regards to what I discussed in terms of training? Is there anything I can clarify? Is there anything you've written down or you've sent to me that I have maybe not answered? If you want to just press the unmute and just fire away. How's it, Dean? How's it? Who's that? It's Mohammed. It's uh, okay, I'm, I'm looking at so many faces on the screen here. Okay, Mohammed, shoot, go ahead. Yeah, yeah I don't want to see Z actually. Or actually, not as yet though, but. My application just went through today, um, but I have already purchased a CZ, so you can't talk me out of it. Um, just a question. <laughs> uh, just a question that I had mentioned in, in regard with obviously the trainer. Um, what and or courses would you advise, like someone for myself who's pretty much waiting for my license? Um, so, pretty much a newbie in regard with um, starting off. Uh, course um, gradually getting into a more detailed course uh, that you mentioned. Okay, um, one of the techniques that we use as trainers that uh, Ridwan will back me up here is, is a technique that we use, we term transferable methodology. Um, transferable methodology is is that an individual can come and train with me in empty hand techniques. And a lot of the techniques that I am facilitating or teaching or instructing on works with other weapon systems. So for example, if I'm teaching or if I'm instructing on uh, impact weapon techniques, a lot of the techniques that I teach because of the transferable methodology are used with other weapon systems such as a firearm. I also, as a good trainer, like to encourage the people that come and train with me to not just focus on one weapon system. Don't just look at the firearm as a solution to all problems. When you attend a lecture with Mr. Jacques Wurzer that Cronier had spoken about earlier, um, you will see that after walking out of that lecture, you will realize that the use of the firearm in not only in South Africa, but now around the world, that, that use of firearm and where you can actually employ the use of a firearm is becoming smaller and smaller. We need to up our skills on other avenues of protection. We need to look at upping our skills in terms of empty hand, our techniques, and it does not have to be complicated. And one of the things that I teach and I advocate is, is that you need to keep 
your technique's very simple. And that's why good empty hand techniques should take a couple of days for you to master, not years. It's no good going to a gym and becoming a black belt. It's going to take seven years. I need to walk out of the gym that afternoon and be able to defend myself or else I'm wasting my time. That comes back to the cost effectiveness. As is, you should be looking at expanding your knowledge on other avenues of protection, such as the use of an impact weapon, the use of an edged weapon, hopefully never, but you never know when you might need to increase the level of force that's being used in terms of the application of more lethal force in terms of the use of an edged weapon. Um, the use of oleoresin capsicum, the certain areas in a combat situation where you can employ other force options. So please don't just look at it as a firearm. The training that I provide and would want to provide together collectively is a, a holistical approach to being, be, being prepared for an eventuality. I hope that answers something for you. Got it, thank you. Just, just uh, kind of a feather in your cap. Uh, you can hear me, right? Yes, I can hear Ross, go. Um, Sorry, Ross, is that, for... is that Father Christmas? Oh, no, it's Ross. Sorry. You know, being single has its, uh, has its advantages. So just uh, I've known you for a few years, mate, and um, I, I can actually say, um, you know, apart from being a good friend with you, you know, someone is a good instructor if you can recognize the golden thread that comes across knowledge and you, you'll definitely find that the prolific instructors around the world, the teachers, all of them, from, from special operations to less known guys, you all say the same things. And that, that's how you know. It's kind of like a parody check that I know you know what you're talking about. You know, something simple like vehicle CTB. The things that you teach, I know for a fact that I've seen with guys from the US and it's, it's, it's top notch. So you definitely know what you're talking about and, and anybody that joins you for courses, man, they're gonna learn a lot. So good on you. Thank, thanks Ross, I appreciate that. Just something that I would like to mention as well is, is that um, just because you're an ex-military instructor, as I am, or just, because you're an ex-police instructor, as I am, does not make you a good instructor to teach civilians. I hope that makes sense to you out there. It does not make you a good instructor to teach civilians because as a military instructor, the techniques that I'm teaching to military personnel are to be employed in times of war by military personnel, not civilians. So you gotta look at your training or your trainer holistically to see if they have the ability to provide you with that relative. And I, I go back to the outcomes, which I stated in the beginning, training needs to be relevant to your needs. You do not have a team of 30 or well, correction, a platoon of 33 people, or you're not part, let me correct that. You're not number 31 or 32 or 33 in a platoon. You are not in a six man team assaulting a building in a, uh, in, in a SWAT type exercise. You are an individual that probably gets woken up in the middle of the night and you're in your PT shorts and you have nothing more than a pistol in your hand and a flashlight in your other hand. And now you're gonna go and investigate what's going on. There's no one else with you. You don't have body armor on and you don't have camo and you don't have all the fancy gadgets. That's the reality of it. And if I'm teaching techniques such as I teach in structure work or if I'm teaching uh, uh, vehicle uh, counter ambush drills. I'm not teaching a military unit. I'm teaching an individual who's probably got his wife and his kids in the car. That type of training is way different to what I would be presenting to military or police personnel. Any questions, guys? See, there's a couple here that are coming through to me privately. Uh, then one one last question. Hopefully, it's not um, um, going to be taking stuff off your future um, cost. But uh, you mentioned uh, handheld uh, flash quite a bit. Um, 
just something would you recommend uh, a hand elf flash rather than a weapon mount flash okay i see red one smiling there Conrad, would you like to answer that one as a student of mine or brian Yeah, um, handheld flashlights is definitely superior to weapon-mounted flash because you can hold it in different positions. It becomes a tactical tool in the sense that it's not always in the same place, which is right in front of your face if you're aiming down your gun. Um, Bean teachers taught us uh, different positions like the FBI, the Willis and Hollis, pictorial, all those sort of things. So the torch itself is, becomes as much of a tool and a weapon as the weapon. Now, if it's connected to your weapon, it has one, one purpose, to point where your gun is and your face is right behind your gun. If I remember correctly, that was the lesson Dean taught me. I don't have to come and fetch your certificate, uh, Conrad. You can keep it now. You did very well. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Guys, um, I get asked a question about uh, tactics and techniques, and I will be covering that in one of my webinars in terms of the flashlights and equipment and that. But yes, the handheld flashlight should be your first port of call, followed by a weapon mounted light. Every weapon should have a light on it. And uh, unless it has a light on it, you shouldn't be carrying it. It's quite that simple. Um, yeah. Any other questions you want to fire away with, guys, before I start uh, winding things down here? A couple of things that I need to make mention of here is, is number one, uh, please pop me a WhatsApp on the feedback regarding this uh, webinar um, or this training intervention. Just pop me, even if it's a two-liner, just say Dean liked it or it sucked or I'd like to be there for the next one or maybe you won't see me. I've got a, another more pressing interview or something. I don't mind. I can take it. Um, the other thing is, is that uh, on Tuesday, more or less at the same time, I'm aiming for about 18.45 uh, CV. That's my time, yeah? Um, I'm going to be doing uh, another one, a little shorter than this one. Um, hopefully by then, I'll know a little bit more how to use the system. And uh, so will you guys. Um, but... I'm going to be discussing types of training that are out there. It will be small. It's not going to be long. It will be probably about 30 minutes. I know this one's run over. I didn't need to run over. Um, but yeah, that's basically what it is. Um, I will be running that. The third course or the third training intervention that I'm going to run is gear. I will be talking about the different types of gear. Now, um, I do talk about gear before I start talking about any tactics. And the reason being is, is as Ridwan had rightfully said, and you'd heard Gunnar bring up the story of the flashlight, there are certain pieces of gear that you require to attend various types of training that's on offer. Whether it be with myself or another good quality trainer, you need to have certain bits of pieces of gear. And if you don't have the gear, you can't get there and participate. It's just that simple. So I will be talking about gear. The fourth webinar that I'm going to be running, which will be a week, a week today, is going to be the force continuum. That's going to be a long one. I'm going to be talking about the force continuum and all the aspects about the force continuum. That's quite an exciting one. It's an area in which I really like to, uh, I like to get feedback from the guys. I like to discuss a lot about the force continuum. Um, very, very important. I just hope that this evening you guys were able to get some information regarding a trainer and now you know what to look out for. Whether you're going to go to the gym and look for a trainer or whether you're going to go look for firearms training or whether you're going to go look for a trainer to go and uh, help assist with your daughter riding horses, these are the type of things that you need to look at. There is a difference between an instructor and a trainer and you definitely need to know that. And you definitely need to know where the facilitator comes out of and what they do. Any questions, guys, before we start logging off? Anything. Neil, you're quiet. You're happy? Yes, well done. Thanks, Dean. Thanks for the good presentation. Hope you enjoyed it, bud. Oh, awesome, man. Hansa, you happy? Yes, I am. Thank you. Okay, 100%. Brian, you okay? You happy? Hmm? 100%, thanks, 
Okay. Shall I? <laughs> Clint, you want to say anything before you go, bud? No, nah, I'm more happy. Adina, it was an awesome, awesome webinar. Eh? It was very informative. Eh? But uh, yeah, like you said, um, the, the gear one's going to be amazing. Because, eh? you know, a lot of times I've been on the course with you, guys come very unprepared eh? with the wrong gear. And like Ridwan said, you land up spending so much money on, on useless crap. Eh? I'll get it. Okay, I'll be there early tomorrow to exercise. Last one. <laughs> See you tomorrow. Yeah, bud. Hundreds. Okay, guys, I'm going to start signing off now. Derek, are you okay? It's up there still. Absolutely. Thank you. I hope you picked up some skills, Derek. Most definitely. Any questions or anything before we bounce, guys? <laughs> Okay, I'm going to say cheers for now, and uh, we chat. Uh, I'll probably see you guys on Tuesday again, unless you make contact with me privately. All right. Thanks, team. Cheers. Okay. Thank Cheerio. Okay, awesome. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night.